Shalom, my little friends. I don't know if this is going to work. It's acting as though it's going to. Thing about this is not just like a, um, that not all ghosts are demonic in nature. Uh, so what is the reason that you would differ on that viewpoint? The number one reason. Okay, so this is Chris Putnam. And um, it's interesting, a few days ago, Yahusha told me to do a video on uh, how people aren't in heaven right now. Um, and it was just this one Bible verse that had come across. And then, you know, I know a few other Bible verses about it. But, uh, and then this morning I was listening to Chris Putnam and he says something at the end um, here that when I, I stop it, um, the reason why I was doing this video in the first place, but it just so happened that he started like talking, he, he was already talking about things that I wanted to do a video about. Like, it's amazing. But he brings up um, one of the Mandela things. Um, but I was going to show y'all clips of his book, Path to the Immortals, while he was speaking. But it seems like my phone's being a punk drinking out of sippy cups. So I'm going to try it again, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, this is a really popular idea in Christianity. I think because it's comfortable. Um, you know, it's kind of scary to think that they're ghosts for Christians because we just have, Christians have these really neat categories where everybody dies like instantly to hell or heaven. But that's really not taught in scripture. I don't, you know, people get that idea and a lot of pastors probably promote that idea. That's not the case. Um, if you read, you know, like, a systematic theology textbook that, I'm talking about a very conservative one, you know, for a very fundamentalist kind of textbook. The one I'm, I would think of right off the bat is Millard Erickson's Christian Theology. Now, this is the textbook I had at Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary, which is a very, you know, conservative Baptist seminary. Um, not liberal theology by any stretch of the imagination. So, you know, Millard Erickson says the intermediate state is very vague in scripture. So, you know, here we have one of the top, you know, conservative theologians, you know, admitting that the Bible just doesn't say a lot about the intermediate state. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean the time between when we die and the return of Christ with the resurrection. You know, a lot of people assume that all this stuff happens instantaneously, that you die, you're judged, you go straight to heaven or hell, but you know, read scripture carefully. You know, it does imply that Christians immediately go to heaven to be with the Lord. Paul says things like, to be away from the body is to be with the Lord. But that's, you know, that's a kind of a quick little phrase there. I don't think he's laying out any boundaries about what can and can't happen or what the metaphysical, you know, if there's some kind of wall where you can't ever leave heaven. It doesn't say anything about that, but it does, it does promise that we'll be with the Lord. And I think that's as far as we can push that. That's a great promise. But if you look at Revelation chapter 20, really the dead are not judged until after the millennium. Um, you know, there's the dead in Christ rise after Christ returned, um, and then there's a, a thousand year reign of Christ on earth, and then the, uns the people that aren't saved are raised from the dead. There's another resurrection, and they're judged at what is called the Great White Throne Judgment. Now, even if you're, if you're not a millennialist, even if you're a millennialist, meaning you don't think that that thousand years are literal, still, you know, the dead haven't, aren't going to be judged until after the return of Christ. So even if we disagree there, there's still this intermediate time between now and the return of Christ when the Great White Throne happens. So there seems to be kind of a, a holding tank, and you know, there's another lot of confusion because English Bible translations routinely throw the word hell around, um, and there's actually three different Greek words for different places. They're not all the same place, but they all get labeled hell in English Bible translations, and that's the problem because it's very inaccurate. Um, there's actually Hades, uh, which is temporary, and that is where the dead go now. In fact, in the Old Testament, even the righteous went to Hades, and there was two compartments. There was one that would be Abraham's bosom, and the other was called abaddened, um, which was where it was kind of the, the bad place. But there was two
two, then there was a, a gulf in between. If you remember Jesus' parable about Lazarus and the rich man, they were both in the same place. They could see each other, but there was a great chasm between them. They were both in Hades. Jesus was talking about the, the Old Testament paradigm. Because no one went to heaven... Um, in the Old Testament paradigm, because it really wasn't until Christ paid the debt for our sins that we would be even able to be in God's presence because of our sinfulness. Until he died for us, you know, we, we, weren't, we weren't clean enough. We would probably, like, catch on fire or something if we came in front of a holy God. Um, it was only through the cross that made that possible. So I don't think maybe, you know, Elijah was taken up to heaven, but he would be an exception. Perhaps Enoch... Maybe, you know, it says that he was taken up to heaven, but they seem to be exceptions to the rule. Um, and of course, the, uh, the main piece of scripture that would falsify that all ghosts are demons is First Samuel chapter 28. This is when King Saul, you know, hired a medium, basically, to rise the prophet Samuel from the grave. And he came up from the underworld, from Sheol. Like I said, everybody, the good and the evil, went to Sheol, which was the equivalent of Hades in Hebrew. Um, so, you know, the text is very clear uh, that this is really Samuel. Now, there have been people through the ages who have tried to say that this is a demon in disguise. But that is called eisegesis. The, um, the narrator, the inspired author of the book of 1 Samuel, calls him Samuel. Um, so unless he was mistaken and the Bible's in error, it wasn't a demon. Um, it's very clearly presented as Samuel. Um, so I just don't see it as an option to try to say this is a demon unless you're willing to, to say the Bible is wrong you know, in that the author was mistaken. Because there's nothing in the text that implies it was a demon at all. That that has to be superimposed on the text. And a lot of people try to make that move. I just don't think it's sound. In fact, you know, I think it really uh, works in the other way. If they do that, they have basically falsified the um, the clear reading of what the author intended for his readers to understand. In fact, if you look at the Septuagint, it, it's even more clear that it was Samuel. Um, it's mentioned in uh, other passages as well that... Samuel spoke uh, to Saul and basically predicted his death, and of course that prophecy came to pass. So there is one very clear instance of a deceased human being called up from the underworld by a medium um, who appears in an apparitional form, wearing the clothes that he was then to wear and his robes. He's described that way by the medium. And, um, you know, he speaks and has a conversation, and he's aware of what's going on on the earth, which is more interesting, because even from the underworld, he knew what Saul's position was. He knew that the Philistine army was surrounding him. He knew that he was about to be defeated. Now, I suspect that, you know, he got that knowledge from God, but it's interesting that he was aware of events on earth, um, and, you know, had some, some things to say. He was quite upset with being raised from the underworld as well. So, you know, it's a mystery, you know, what is beyond death to us. It's just, the scripture doesn't give us a lot of information. It gives us some great promises. We have a lot of hope in that. But as far as how all that works and what you can and can't do and what God allows and doesn't allow, most of that is what people superimpose onto it. It's really not found in the text. Now, when you get to the New Testament, I think you get some really strong confirmations that not all ghosts are demons as well. Um, you know, I think one that's kind of pushing the limits, and I'll just say that right off the bat. I, I don't know how valid it is to use this as an example, but at the Transfiguration, uh, Moses, who we know was deceased, appeared with Jesus. Um, now, Elijah appeared well, but like I said, Elijah was taken up into heaven, so he actually didn't die. So I couldn't say that he was a spirit. Um, it's a little special case there, but Moses certainly did die. Uh, and the book of Jude says that even Michael and the devil fought over his bones, wow. which is an interesting thing all of in and of itself. Um, I don't really understand why that happened, but they had some kind of angelic battle over his dead body. Um, but Moses appears in apparitional form with Jesus. That's kind of a, a special case, but it is an example of a deceased human appearing. Um, but I think the most conclusive for me, um, it's clear the disciples believed in ghosts, but, you know, that's not necessarily telling us that it's true. But I said the first time they saw, they thought when Jesus was walking on the water. The disciples were afraid. They go, oh, look, it's a ghost. Jesus says, no, it's me. Now, he had a 
chance to rebuke them and say, well, why would you believe such a silly superstition? There's no such thing as ghosts. He didn't say that. Um, or, don't you know that all ghosts are demons? <laughs> he didn't say that. But that's an argument from silence, so that's not you know, completely convincing. But it is suggestive, the fact that he didn't correct them. It's suggestive. But really the conclusive one, and I think this should be enough for most Christians to at least open their minds to the possibility, is that in Luke 24, after the resurrection, the disciples were walking along and Jesus appears to them. And they're scared to death. They go, oh, no, it's a ghost. Uh, the word in Greek is, uh, which is spirit, but, you know, they see a man walking towards them and they think it's a spirit. That's, that's what we call a ghost. I don't think that's stretching uh, the, the, the use of the language in, in, at all. Uh, right. But Jesus said, no, it's me. Uh, he says, now here's the part that I think is, is very um, conclusive. Jesus says, no, it's me. I have flesh and bones. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. You know, come touch me, feel me, I do. So rather than saying ghosts don't exist or, you know, I'm not a demon or any of those kind of things, Jesus says he distinguishes himself from a ghost by the attributes of a ghost. It doesn't have flesh and bones, which implies that it has to be something real that he's comparing himself to or it wouldn't make any sense. Um, and then he says, I have flesh and bones. So based on my attributes, I'm not a ghost compared to a ghost. For him to make that argument, implicit is that ghosts do exist. I think that that logic is, is rock solid. I, I don't see any flaw in that reasoning at all. Um, you, you can't compare yourself you know, to something that's not real and make a distinction. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really not a, a good way to speak. It's kind of misleading for him to do so. So it seems to me that Jesus did believe in ghosts. Um, and as Christians, we should adopt the worldview of Jesus. Um, now, I don't deny that there are deceiving spirits that would pose as humans in order to trick somebody. I don't. I think that that's, that might account for a lot of the, the ghost stories we hear. You know, I don't know, but I don't think it accounts for all of them. And I think that's the danger is that Christians want to be comfortable and they have kind of a fear-based mentality that if they allow for any possibility of this, this is somehow going to, you know, confuse them. Well, you know, we always have all the answers, people. You know, we have to, to be intellectually honest and examine things on a case-by-case basis. It's just not fair to anyone to blanketly label everything demons and, and, and then not even process the, the data, uh, to not listen to people, to not to, to test the spirits as we're commanded to do in First John. I don't think if, you know, if all the spirits were demons, why would we even need to bother to test them? I think that there are, you know, there's some stories, I think, falsified the ghost hypothesis. And I think scripture you know, does give us warrant. Hey, okay, we're recording. Okay. They, they were um, having a lot of issues, um, technical issues with this video. Um, and every time that happens, like, it, especially with Anthony Patch, a lot. Um, because he really comes against this ancient technology and, and speaking of the truth, you know, of these fallen angels and where they've been hidden and, and, and you know, um, stories of, of truth uh, of, about, you know, what their role is in the end time. And Chris Putnam, um, they believe that he was killed um, because of the things that he exposed. And I, I just... He, he was an amazing writer, uh, and he was truly Holy Spirit when in breath filled. And, and, you know, you can just hear it in him. You can hear that, that he read. But did you hear that? Um, I believe that, that it still said bones when he was alive in, in Jude the book of Jude, the, the Bible verse. That's why, I, I mean, I was listening to this this morning when he said that, I just, I paused it and, and I was like, oh, we gotta, we gotta say, you know, talk about this. Um, because here's one of our, um, truthers, 
you know, um, believers that actually read the Bible verse himself and is speaking about it just in conversation. And there he is saying that it was bones and not body. So here's, you know, some proof that the Mandela effect really did happen. Um, but it is interesting that our friend there was talking about heaven and, um, you know, the Bible verses that speak about heaven and, and the Bible verses that speak about hell. And um, as I was going thumbing through, letting y'all see a little bit about the book of the um, Path to the Immortals, I noticed that as he was bringing up Sheol uh, in the book, Sheol was brought up. Uh, I just thought that was amazing. I love how the Holy Spirit, when in breath, works. I really, I mean, he, he just connects everything for us all the time. But um, in Matthew 13, 17, Let's just read it. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Recently, uh, a friend of mine and I were talking, and I was like, the things that are happening, the prophecies that are being fulfilled right now, the prophets would have loved to have seen this day. And she said, they're looking down on us right now and they see it. And I'm like, no, nobody's in heaven right now, you know. And she, no, Ashley, you cannot tell me that. People are in heaven. I know they are. And, and I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, people are not in heaven yet. Um, and then so this morning, it was just a matter well, two three days ago when I was walking and reading this Bible verse, it was just amazing that Yahushua had blessed, you know, blessed me with this Bible verse because I knew that it was in there. And he even, he even uh, plainly speaks that they have not heard these things that, that, that are being seen today. They have not seen these things um, that, that we see. Uh, and even the disciples were seeing. And the disciples, they even um, have these same... Uh, thing that they said about them because they were prophets you know the disciples were prophets um jesus yahushua is this his testimony is the spirit of prophecy um and if he is the word of yahuwah god almighty he is the spirit of prophecy so so when you are testifying about yahushua jesus um you're speaking prophecy it is it is his testimony so therefore you are you know speaking prophecy but that's not why we're bringing this up we're talking about this because no one's in heaven yet Yahushua woke me up in Revelation showing me that nobody was in heaven yet. And it, it's Revelation 6, 9 through 10. Um, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of Yahuwah. And for the word of Yahuwah and for the testimony which they held. Excuse me. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Yahuwah Lord? holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth and white robes were given unto every one of them and it was yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled that show nobody's in heaven yet and even in ecclesiastes he said the day of one's um death is better um than the day of one's birth. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Oh, that didn't, that's not, well, I mean, we can just go ahead and talk about that. We're, I, I will not go to funerals because, you know, we're supposed to be rejoicing that these people are no longer under the sin of, of, of the sun, you know, under the sun in the sin. Um, but yet uh, we rejoice when a child is born under the sin uh, in sin under the sun and so we cry and mourn when someone passes away and it's supposed to be the exact opposite of that but everyone is asleep under I, I got distracted and don't but that was Yahushua apparently someone needed to hear that um, about the funerals and, and, and the birth um, you know I, I totally believe in the Holy Spirit when in breath that he works like that. So apparently somebody needed to hear that. Hallelujah. But no one is in heaven yet. You know, um, reincarnation uh, the, is, is not a true thing. 
And all the Bible verses that prove reincarnation also prove that no one is in heaven yet. That everyone's in, in sleeping, you know. You got Ecclesiastes, and, and I've done this a while back. Um, I'll just find the reincarnation one. Um, but Ecclesiastes four, um, two through three. Ecclesiastes nine, five through six. I I suggest read the whole book of Ecclesiastes. It's only twelve chapters, and they're short chapters. They're not long at all. It's a it's a great book to read, um, to show us, um, how to be human, you know, um how to be man and woman and, and and who our father is that that there's nothing that we can do to change anything um the only thing i believe that when we pray for folks that we are praying because we were chosen um before we were already born you know chosen to make that prayer for that person um you know, you've you've got the ones where the blind man who who was blinded, and the the disciples come up to him and they say, you know, Jesus, um, is he blind because of the sin of his mom or his dad, and and uh, or his sin? And Jesus is like, no. Yahushua said, no, it's not for any of that. It's for the glory of Yahuwah God Almighty. Um, that man being blind all that time people had to see him blind for all those years so that when jesus yahushua came at the right of time that man was already appointed before he was in his mother's womb to be blind and yahushua says it's for my glory if he hadn't been blind all that time and people seen him when yahushua came to to take away the blindness from his eyes he wouldn't have been one of his miracles so he you know we don't understand we do not understand the movements of our father you know his judgments and ecclesiastes um teaches us that as well you know there there's so many things that we try as man and woman to grasp an understanding of but yahuwah tells us that he put the world in our hearts so that we cannot understand certain things we need to trust more in him and pray his will be done instead of, you know, oh, stop this from happening or stop that from happening. We need to be praying first, you know, that will be done. You who should reveal to me, bless me with spiritual discernment. And I love the way Chris Putnam said it, you know, um, if uh, there were not good and bad um, spirits, then why would we have to discern them? You know, and that... That's a true statement. Um, we know that the evil spirits are the disembodied spirits of the giants. And I believe that they found that out um, after Chris Putnam. You know, that this has been revealed to us after Chris Putnam passed away. I'm not sure. It's possible that Chris Putnam was given this revelation before he passed away so that he could give it to other people. Um, but... Uh, you you heard him say he wasn't quite sure, um, you know, where the spirits, uh, it, it, what they are, who they are. It's the giants, the disembodied spirits of the giants. That's exactly what the um, evil spirits are. The unclean spirits. That's why they're called unclean spirits, familiar spirits. They're, they're named, you know, they, they have these names. You got, um, all right. And you know, angels, angels are actually called um, spirits. Interesting. We'll do research into that. We're going to talk about that one some more. Hallelujah. Because I think that's in uh, uh, Hebrews, I believe, that he speaks about that. Hallelujah. Interesting. Okay. Well, Y'all have a blessed day in the name of Yahushua. And thanks so much for listening. Let's get this thing 